Super. Well, it's five o'clock, so uh, I think we should probably get going. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Athena Watson, and as a vice president of the Society for the Study of Medieval Languages and Literature, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Society and our president, Professor Jane Taylor, to the Society's annual lecture, which is hosted this year by the Centre for Medieval Studies at the University of York. We're sorry not to be together in person today, but actually delighted um, that online allows us to gather together from far and near. Every year, the Society holds its annual lecture and annual general meeting. Some of you will have just arrived from the AGM, which among its many tasks, announces the winner of our annual essay prize. And I want to take this opportunity to recognize this year's winner, James Parkhouse from Oxford, and his essay, Legend in the Landscape, The Revenge of Wayland in Southern English Toponymy. Congratulations, James, a huge achievement. Um, we also have a Proxima Kesset, Aileen Malcolm, uh, and, her essay, uh, and, and their essay on um, All Dogs Go to Heaven, Reason, Literary Style, and Animal Cognition in Adelard of Bath's Questiones Naturalis. Before we begin, there are a few pieces of housekeeping. This lecture is being recorded and the lecture itself will be available online shortly. There is also closed captioning available. You can make this visible, I believe, through your more button at the bottom of the screen. Do be aware that it will use its imagination in transforming medieval French into modern English text. Um, the Society's annual lecture is a chance to invite and to celebrate a distinguished scholar whose work has transformed a field or fields in medieval studies. And this year, we are particularly delighted to welcome Professor Jocelyn Wogan Brown. Through her many publications, she has transformed our understanding of the vernacular literature of medieval England, a Francophone literary culture, and medieval women's literary and spiritual worlds. Jocelyn has taught in Australia, Europe, and America, including as Professor of Medieval Literature here at York, where over a decade later, we can still feel her presence. Anyone who's worked with Jocelyn or had the privilege of talking to her can testify to her formidable scholarship, her humanity and her intellectual electricity. It's a powerful and an inspiring combination. Jocelyn is now the Emerita Thomas F. X. and Teresa Malarkey Chair in Literature at Fordham University, New York, and an Emerita Fellow of the Medieval Academy of America. Together with Thelma Fenster and Delbert Russell, she recently published Vernacular Literary Theory from the French of England, Texts and Translations, 1120 to 1450, which is now available as an ebook. This work is both prequel and successor to her 1999 publication, The Idea of the Vernacular for Medieval English Literature. And like that volume is an argued anthology designed both to characterize and open up the riches of England's French literature for students and scholars alike. She's currently working on a series of studies towards a monograph on women's literary culture from the 13th to the 15th centuries, with particular emphasis on Francophone literacies in England. Jocelyn will talk today on women and multilingualism in late medieval England, and she's kindly agreed at the end of her talk to answer questions. We will use the chat function to do this. Jocelyn stresses that she's particularly keen to talk to MA and PhD students, so do flag if this is you. I should note too that Jocelyn has provided a rich bibliography which can be accessed at the top of the chat. So with no further ado, I will hand you over to Jocelyn and to et stellum matutinum vous donnera to go to bed, William and, William, women and multilingualism in late medieval England. Jocelyn. Thank you very much, Thena. It's lovely to be back at York, one of the most brilliant medieval centres even if just in a virtual way. And I'm grateful to the Society and to you for the inv invitation and to you and to Gillian Galloway and to Stephen Pink for all the organizational work. Um, the bibliography is there because I can't possibly cite all the wonderful scholars from whose work I've profited in trying to think about this. Um, and some of it actually isn't mentioned here because there wasn't room in my final set of cups, but I've left it there anyway. Okay, so let's begin. Some introductory considerations. Um, the mu multilingualism is relatively well studied in women's literary and textual culture in the 11th to 13th centuries. For the 13th to 15th centuries, for many institutional and disciplinary reasons pertaining to Middle English studies, multilingualism is less often conceptualized and investigated for women. Medieval women's multilingualism is different from men's, affected as it is, for instance, by the partial exclusion of women from institutional Latinity and from some occupations. Working with gendered multilingualism, however, is not to create a separate feminized space, 
but rather to open up women's participation in a multilingual society's changing configurations of language, literature, and documentation, as also to continue complicating the ideas of nation so often resisted by the linguistic situation of England. Now, redressing the state of affairs is not necessarily a matter of finding new women writers, though under a non, we probably do have some, as it is, I think, of looking at how women's literary and textual culture functions as a productive matrix. Women's patronage has increasingly been accepted as an important engine of literary production, especially in a literary culture where the textual cachet of the patron's name may well be more important than that of the writer, and the pa pa patron may very actively shape the agenda. Moreover, a recent consensus among historians agrees that medieval elite women, and perhaps some others, exercised power and agency not as a matter of exception, but as a routine structural aspect of socio-political life. And if the various configurations of power and agency exercised by medieval women are structural, we can think in more collective terms of women's literary culture as being a still more pervasive cultural force than even study of specific networks has revealed. The framework for many literate domains used by women remains the household and family, but the medieval secular household is itself an institution, landowning or productive in agrarian, artisanal and mercantile ways, rather than a separate private realm, and an institution of much common culture and convention, as well as socio-political importance. For the later Middle Ages, women's linguistic worlds, of course, included certain kinds of Latinity, rather more, especially among conventual women, than we used to think. There is also excellent work currently in progress on 15th century Anglo-French, but still the largest underused resource throughout women's and indeed England's literary history remains French, insular or otherwise, in all its changing relations with Latin and English. Yet, if we follow Ian Short's recent argument that all four texts credited to Marie de France are linguistically the work of up to four separate writers, French gives us five or six 12th and 13th century women writers, given that we already have the Brun Franco Latinate Clements of Barking and the writer of Edward the Confessor's Life, who is either Clements's younger self or her consoeur at Barking Abbey. I'll be mainly concentrating on French from the 13th to 15th centuries here. My title quotation, It's Stella Matutna Boudoura to Go to Bed, shows French in one of its characteristic 13th century roles as both matrix and mediatrix in a literary composition for women. The quotation forms part of a bravura, apocalyptic culmination to Salut, Se Solas en Jesus Christ, a letter treatise of greeting and comfort composed in the late 13th century for women in the religious life. And I'll just, I'm so sorry, share my screen, which I forgot to do and get it up for you if I can. Um, come on. Yep, there we go, from the beginning. Sorry, I should have done that right at the start, shouldn't I? Um, there we go. Okay. Um, so uh, the first slide can, it offers a little more context for that um, quotation in my title. Um, and this text offers a welter of promises from St. John's vision in Revelation, in which those conquering the devil become queens in heaven and go to a celestial bed in an eschatology of specifically feminized chivalric and erotic triumph. Here, the biblical and liturgical Latinity with which women were familiar is referenced in the promised morning star, it's Stella Matutinum from Revelations too. But French, voudra, is the matrix language. English, is a more occasional presence in the text than even Latin, and as here with Togota Beda, functions mainly as a rhetorical register of intimacy. Now, this is not xenoglossia, the sudden quasi Pentecostal speaking of unknown tongues, but rather a summative drawing together of the audience's sound world and textual experience in the discourse of apocalypse. And indeed, truly monoglot literacy and even audiency is virtually unknown in medieval England. Readers of English were trained on the Psalter and Books of Hours in what remained a Latinate or Franco-Latinate text type throughout the Middle Ages, with English runic letters not found in primer alphabets until a solitary case in 1487. And of course, audiosy of sermons and mass uh, necessarily involves multilingualism and much uh, English literature involves a lot of French lexis. Now, literary French often has the same elite associations that pertain to written Old English, 
both of them serving as an elite written koine in the articulation and maintenance of power. But the uses and text types of French extend and continuously shift and change in relation to other languages in England and elsewhere across the later Middle Ages. From the 1940s work of the pioneering Helen Suggett onwards, it has become clear that French was a meritocratic, pragmatic and documentary language in later medieval England into at least the 1520s, predominantly written, but also spoken in particular registers beyond its routine use in English and aristocratic, royal co uh, aristocratic courts. And Latin and French documentary culture from the 13th to the 15th century, as Malcolm Richardson argued in 2010, is what familiarized London citizens, merchants and artisans, male and female, with the uses of writing as they dictated, edited and discussed documents they needed, which in the 15th century eventually came to include English language documents. Even for elite women, Documentary culture offers us valuable counterpoints to normative literary discourses on the body, socio-spiritual formation, and much else that has been seen as creating the conditions for an, at best, negotiated subaltern agency for women. For Jewish women in England, as Adrian Boyerin has recently shown, documentary culture pr provides considerable evidence for women's multilingual agency in French and Latin in commerce, the law, and other spheres. And this makes a substantial addition to what remains of the literary evidence of Hebrew Latin contact and some French mediation of the wider Hebrew European literary culture as it interacted with English conditions. So in the rest of this talk, I will briefly instance some women's legal documents in part one. Then in part two, some features of 13th century literary culture, so extraordinarily rich for women, especially when French is included alongside English and Latin. And in part three, outline a late medieval tradition of household spiritual direction by women. So in effect, a whistle-stop tour of some of the ways in which French can be further thought into women's and everybody's literary and textual history in England. Part one, women employ different linguistic registers across Latin, French and English in the course of getting things done. Eleanor de Boone, Countess of Gloucester, who died in 1399, stipulates in her French language will that at all the masses she has ordered for her own soul and that of her husband, Thomas, sometime Duke of Gloucester, the priest, before he begins the et ne nos, should say aloud, turning towards the people, for the soul of Thomas, Sumatim, Duke of Gloucester, and Eleanor, his wife, and all Christen souls for charite pater noster. No English sentence without its Latin and French components. Uh, the priest is then to turn towards the altar and recite a pater noster silently, in secret, and to begin the mass. And in these masses, Eleanor specifies, there should be said the prayer, Deus quia summa nostra redemptionis spes. God, the essence of our hope for our redemption. Now, a French written matrix, English speech, and Latin liturgical literacy express exactly what Eleanor wants, and they show her sociolinguistic awareness. She chooses an extended form of Latin memorial mass based on the proper trentals of uh, the um, uh, popular trentals of St. Gregory, but through an English language announcement, she ensures that the entire congregation can contribute their spiritual witness. She specifies a particular Latin collect that was sometimes, but not always, added into such masses. A clerk may have scribed for her, but it makes no sense to see Eleanor, who had earlier commissioned a psalter hours with Latin prayers and confessional forms, and who shows familiarity with the nature and significance of the books she bequests from her library of some 120 volumes, as not shaping her own document. Contextually, Eleanor de Bohun's will represents just that, her will the exercise of individual agency amidst a matrix of convention and institution and a ready navigation of different registers across languages in enacting that agency. Much more to be said about the law, but I'll focus here on a notable legal initiative, which is the protestation by the widowed Elizabeth de Burgh against Edward II's notoriously ruthless crown ministers, the Dispensers, and the younger Dispensers' seizure of Elizabeth's Welsh estates in 1326. De Berg creates a French language document, which she reads aloud to her councillors and churchmen at Clare Castle, and she has a notary take it down. The notary records in his Latin framing of the document that de Berg sh uh, showed and read de verbo ad verbum, a parchment document written in Gallica lingua, and he has written it out below. And within her document, 
de Berg tells of earlier pressures, including her imprisonment in Barking Abbey, as the dispensers try to take her lands in Usk in exchange for much less valuable ones in Gower. And in her conclusion, she states that, as you see on the slide, pour but d'être arrêté ou surmise, que je sois de la couvine et de la sante de ceux que le roi tient ses ennemis, je, Elisabeth, fasse la protestation devant vous, notaire et témoigne que si êtes présence, que si aucune terre me soit livrée en récompensation, récompensation de la dite terre de Goa, que je ne les accepte, n'accepterai en nulle manière par ma franche volonté. And she declares her intention to sivre mon droit des terres que me sont à tort détenues, à quelle heure que grâce soit plus ouverte et les de terres mieux maintenues et communes à tous. Et face la protestation, que cette protestation, soudite dite, voudrait faire à perte et publier selon ce que les écrites demandent, si doute au royal poète avait le péril que peut suivre, ne me détourne pas. They put too bad. Um, as de Berg clearly understands, faire protestation, a phrase from the Anglo-Norman yearbooks of Edward II, is to make a formal assertion or claim to protect the rights of a party in a lawsuit or a demand or a petition that such a reservation be recognized or admitted. She makes, of course, a further protestation that she can't publish her protestation at this time as the written law would demand, but she has it dated and witnessed as to her actions at the time of the dispenser's land grab. Her protestation combines skillful legal maneuvering with jurisprudential and moral outrage about the perversion of the law. And however much she consulted with her counselors, her, st her staff and the notary, it undoubtedly expresses her position. As a major magnate, Elizabeth de Berg commanded bureaucratic resources at an institutional level that renders moot our modern private public binary in relation to women's literate history. But women with smaller scale resources also participated in the law. Petitions to Parliament, for instance, are another text type where French alongside Latin is a standard or default language. Women used professional scriveners, attorneys or clerks working for the City of London to formulate and write their petitions. Mark Ormrod's brilliant and alas penultimate 2020 book on women in Parliament from Edward I to Henry VI reign, establishes a corpus of 921 petitions by women, whether in their own right as femmes seules or with their husbands or collectively as female religious houses. Although this is only 12% of the extant petitions, it's notable that under Edwards I, II and three, not only noble, but gentry women and women of lesser standing, including peasant women, submitted pleas. Now, other domains in which a Franco-Latin matrix reveals women's agency include language acquisition, teaching, estate management, and accountancy. There's no space here to discuss these, but I will just suggest that the extremely detailed gifts of seed to family members in women's wills correlate with women's patronage and ownership of French language treatises on agrarian estate management from the 13th century on, and suggest an informed understanding among many women landholders even though such bequests were no doubt decided on in consultation with a steward or a reeve. These latter might, by the way, be on occasion a woman, usually a widow with some small property. French could also link women and their employees. As Richard Ingham has shown, landowners could be addressed by and hear the accounting processes of their reeves and stewards in French, mixed with English technical and local terms before clerks wrote the record up in Latin. And women of lower social status could improve their socioeconomic prospects as employees of noble women and urban elites and as entrance to nunneries, often by speaking French rather than necessarily writing it, though that too. And medical, herbal, cosmetic and calendrical domains for female agency can also be added without our having to wait for English in the 15th century. So pragmatic literacy, I think, has more to show us about women's actions and agency if we attend to all its linguistic registers. Part two. When we turn to literary culture, it's often forgotten that Anglo-Norman composition and circulation of texts was not only extremely rich in the 13th century, it continues into the 15th century alongside increasing numbers of English language works. Here is a bold summary for religious genres, 
with a surprisingly large tilt towards the 14th and 15th centuries. And when we add the large, not yet fully quantified numbers of Anglo-French or French texts in circulation in the 14th, 15th century, and Julia Mattison's extraordinary doctoral and current research has already added some 700 insular manuscripts, not in Dean and further continental manuscripts, the volume of French literature in late medieval England is very considerable. From the 13th to the 15th centuries, we can think of an Anglo-French literary culture participated in and often led by women. A most notable newly found instance is Catherine Smith's marvelous work on the Wells Ross Bible. This is the first full vernacular Bible in England and it's commissioned in the early 14th century by Lady Maud de Ross. It's not Wycliffeite, it's not in English and it's done through a women's, a women's agency. But I will concentrate here on the illustrated apocalypse in the 13th century. In the surviving corpus of 79 illustrated Anglo-French apocalypse books, lay women are prominent among the owners whose names we actually know. The bulk of their apocalypses are Franco-Latinate with one or more elements, a preface on St. Paul's and Augustinian vision theory, or the text of Revelation itself, or commentary on it in French, sometimes with further customized additions. Now beyond specific reading circles, such as those around Henry III's Queen, Eleanor of Provence, or Matthew Paris's baronial consumers and patrons of French and Latin saints' lives, many of the book owners in this Anglo-French literary culture of baronial gentry and royal women are linked in various ways with each other. The two possible patron, women patrons of the Lambeth Apocalypse, Eleanor de Ferrers and Margaret de Quincey, for example, became Eleanor de Quincey and Margaret Ferrers in their second and first marriages respectively, and each also became both the daughter-in-law and the mother-in-law of each other. Given the endogamy that drives baronial alliances and property maximization, maximization, I think the relation of these two women is less the exception as the great Nigel Morgan implied, implied than the jackpot for English baronial lineage practices. And such closeness of women's lineal and marital ties and the networks of royal courts and barony provide vectors for a literary culture more than personal, underlining the individual but culturally collective nature of non-speculatively produced books and literary texts in this multiply interlinked milieu. And illustrated apocalypse books support a reading culture of considerable activity. Like other devotional genres, apocalypse is not a single discourse. As well as mystical spiritual absorption into the heavenly Jerusalem, the visionary book of Revelation with its end time wars, clashing beasts, ecological and other catastrophes, and final cosmic dissolution and judgment has affinities with epic and romance. It also has strong resonances for the mid 13th century preoccupation with crusading at the English and Capetian royal courts, queened respectively by Eleanor of Provence and her sister Margaret, and for the production of grail literature as well as exploiting some conventions for visually othering Christianity's enemies. Women, both as subjects and as readers, participate in all the dimensions of Apocalypse's capacious and adaptable discourse. The lavish Trinity Apocalypse of the later 1250s was produced possibly for Eleanor of Provence, possibly for her daughter-in-law. The armorial bearings of Simon de Montfort, married to Henry III's sister, but leader of the most intense baronial rebellion of the reign, have been discerned by Adrian Ailes among the forces of the Antichrist. And we also see two women among the saints battling the beast of the apocalypse. It's hard here not to remember that Eleanor of Provence was an important gatherer of troops for Henry III's failed ventures overseas and for his running battles against baronial rebellion, as well as herself a taker of the crusading oath along with Henry in 1250. But this image has further political resonances. Together with her daughter-in-law, Eleanor of Castile, Eleanor of Provence may also have been, as E.M. Rose has recently argued, a force behind her son's expulsion of the Jews, an ideological and not only a financial matter. Both women, that's the two Eleanors, favoured spiritual advisers from the friars and Franciscan preaching encouraged the expulsion. You'll see a friar in the, uh, the picture there from the Trinity Apocalypse, the image um, being trodden beneath the feet of the beast. Both women had been rebuked by churchmen for their usurious engagement 
with the Jews they owned in their towns and lands. Both were facing their own mortality in the 1280s, one through age and the other through illness. Encouraging their son and husband to the Christian militancy of the expulsion may have been in part an anticipation and a kind of Christian reparation of their death, ready for their deaths. I would add to this argument that in the Trinity Apocalypse from their royal circle, the treatment of the Mulier Amic de Sole and her dealings with the seven-headed dragon has the French version of Berengordus's commentary specify the Jews as the sixth wave of church persecutions signified by the dragon's seven heads immediately before Antichrist himself becomes the seventh. By contrast, in Lady Eleanor de Quincey, or just possibly Lady Margaret Ferrer's Lambeth Apocalypse, the Latin Berengordus commentary makes the seven heads simply omnium reprobos, all the reprobates. And in the following battle with the beast, Lambeth has the earth signify those who take up carnal desires, while Trinity comments, par la terre, les dieux. Apocalypse is just one of the ways in which devotion and biblical exegesis are borderless and multiple discourses in women's reading. In these two images of the crucifixion and the powers of the holy blood, which is romance? Which religion? That's a rhetorical question. Um, for Eleanor of Provence, the devotional is also the political in Rossignos, the magnificently sonorous and allegorically inventive 5,000 line poem on Christ's passion composed for her by John of Howden. Here, the heart whose remembrance of the passion makes the soul God's spouse has a sword more powerful than Judith's by which the head of the beast is continuously cut off. If the lamb's blood paints Eleanor's heart with his arms, no hero is greater from Judas Maccabeus to classical Arthurian, Romance, Norman and Plantagenet rulers and crusaders up to Charles d'Anjou and to Eleanor's father, husband and her son, Prince Edward. This multifaceted trans transnational reading culture shared by lay and religious women and overlapping with, but not confined to, male clerical, monastic and secular reading practices, maintains and reproduces literacy as well as power, especially as it includes Psalters and books of ours and primer reading and training of children, as well as the apocalypses and much else. It also supports the many specialized crafts of bookmaking and it intersects with many types of reading beyond its immediate purposes. For the later 14th century English language apocalypses translated from the Anglo-Norman, as for other genres, this culture forms both a matrix and a continuing environment. Some French language apocalypses continued to be read into the 15th century. A part three. I want now to pursue another type of book from the 13th to the 15th century, the devotional miscellany, object of a burst of recent research as the idea of compilatio is explored. Manuscript collections of devotional and didactic texts have been acclaimed as a new genre of Middle English book developing in the 14th and especially the 15th century, often owned by male heads of secular households. But if we count French in, Women's direction of household spirituality via such compilations antedates this development and indeed provides a continuing tradition alongside it. I will look briefly at four books. Number one, an increasingly well-known example is the collection of pastoralia commissioned between 1280 to 98 by Joan de Tattersall, wife of a Lincolnshire baron. Designed for educating the household, the pastoral authority of this book is shared between the patroness and the great pastoral Bishop Grosstest, whom Joan de Tassel had known. As discourses, pastoralia are no more monoglot than apocalypses, and the verse sermon Roman des Romans in Joan's manuscript, in common with many other works, suggests how moralizing and didactic works could offer women a way of thinking about social order and social justice. The satire engendered in Anglo-Norman and Anglo-French homiletic use of a state's theory is often actually more disruptive than Christine de Pizan's relentless defense of existing order in her Livre de Corps de Policy. Book two. French was not confined to England, of course. And we can look across the channel to another early household book, a manuscript commissioned in the 1330s by Henry III of England's granddaughter, Marie de Bretagne, 
Dowager Countess of St. Paul. This manuscript has been several times commented on for its particularly eloquent and sophisticated assimilation of women's reading and Christ's passion. Here's a close up. The manuscript is a collection of 19 French works or French versions of doctrinal and socio-spiritual formation now extant in three almost identical manuscripts in the Saint Paul family, all made within the decade and all using the same artist. According to its French colophon, Marie de Bretagne planned the book in order, as she says, to leave after us something with which the children we have had in our care can busy themselves spiritually and be thoroughly well brought up and instructed and our good friends and our lords and ladies. So the best explanation for the book's multiple identical copies is that the patron wanted the same style of spirituality among the various St. Paul households, of which she is in effect with her staff of priests and clerks, the spiritual director. Here, maternal spiritual leadership is doing something that other secular leaders do with vernaculars, emblematizing their leadership in a standardized language and making sure key retainers have a copy. King Alfred of England is Christine de Pizon's president for a translation program in her biography of Charles, Charles V. But we can see Marie de Bretagne as exemplifying the way the household can also institutionalize itself in language. And underlining the cross-channel nature of this continuing Francophone literary culture, another of Marie de Bretagne's books, uh, Edgerton 745, contains a 14th century prose remaniement of the nun of Barking's 12th century, Lie de saint Edouard le Confesseur. Book number three. Marie de Bretagne's daughter, Marie de Saint-Paul, was married to Aylmer de Valence, Count of Pembroke, in 1321. Following his death shortly after, Marie de Saint-Paul spent her long and active widowhood of some 53 years based in England, with a favorite residence in East Anglia. She was, among other things, a trusted diplomatic messenger for Edward III, and like her friend Elizabeth de Burgh in Clare Castle, foundress of a Cambridge college. There are at least seven books directly associated with Marie de Saint-Paul, and I want to propose a further manuscript association in the context of the Saint-Paul women's books of household spiritual direction. Royal 16E5 is a collection of continental French prose treatises copied in England in the early 15th century. A historiated initial at the opening of the book's first text has been read as a saint delivering a book to a lady. In my view, it shows the reverse direction of cultural agency. It is rather the sword begirt Saint Paul blessing a book sponsored by Marie de Saint Paul. This first text is a miroir de l'âme. Its prologue inscribes Marie de Saint Paul as its destinatrix. Given that the manuscript is in a single high end script and hand, it's probable that the royal manuscript represents a copy of a book originally compiled for Marie de Saint Paul, who died in 1377. That the dedication would still be prestigious in the early 15th century is suggested by Marie de Saint Paul's continuing influence. This is testified to by donations and book bequests in her memory to her foundation of the Franciscan nunnery of Denny by William de Burke, one of her executors who died in 1414, and by Marjorie de Nerford, a wealthy London vowers who died in 1417. Marie de Saint Paul's opening Murat text organizes spiritual life through the trope of alienating the daughter from her family home. Audi filia, forget your father's house and the king will desire your beauty, as Psalm 44 has it. This signifies both the alienation of any soul in its earthly habitation and the physical alienation of elite women who routinely expected to be required to leave their father's house and region to take on a marital household. The treatise's aristocratic spirituality of informed world weariness, together with the cultivation of refined devotional love and contemplation, combines with the promise that the reader will have an ultimate stable home, une maison sûre, in heaven, where she will have all she desires by way of the sweetness of love and the balm of contemplation beyond the earthly work of multicultural and multilingual assimilation. 
There, there will be a single language, a single perfect joy, a single devotion. In that country, there will be no linguistic differences, but concord of desire and custom will prevail there, harmonizing and peaceful. The Miroir text, inscribed as Marie de saint Paul's, thus links us into a Francophone spirituality in which metaphors of alienation and longing for a true home are put to work in managing the spirituality of large and mobile households on either side of the channel. Finally, book number four. This is one of the two large Francophone compilations at 15th century Barking Abbey. In this case, the book left by a member of Barking's paternal family, Elizabeth de Vere, Countess of Oxford, who died in 1473 to four, who had spent time in Rouen in the Duke of York's entourage during her married life. De Vere is best known to English literary history as the destinatrix of one of Osborne Buckingham's English language Legendies of Holy Women of 1445, and also as a member of the family that owned the Ellesmere manuscript of the Canterbury Tales. Her own devotional compilation is a little known late 14th century manuscript of some 200 leaves containing a structured collection of 28 mostly prose continental French doctrinal and devotional treatises. This is extant in nine copies of differing mise en page, but with the same grouping of texts and in the same order. The latest copy being made for Jacques Duc de Nemours around the time of Elizabeth de Vere's death in 1373 to four. That is to say, this is not an old fashioned manuscript or text, but something in demand in, 14th and 15th, in the 14th and 15th centuries in magnate and religious houses. The opening text in the book assumes a practiced collective and individual reading culture in its audiences and assumes too, audiences who are accustomed to some control of their own devotional lives and reading. Remembering women's reading traditions in Anglo-French culture, this is no surprise. Where Marie de Bretagne read Christ as crucified on or in a bifolium, here the crucifixion is assimilated with the entire material book. Les livres en quoi nous devons spécialement lire sans nous l'entrelacement, c'est la douce remembrance de la mort et de la passion de Jésus-Christ. Les parchemins de ce livre et la pure chair et la santé que naquit et mourut sans péché. Le fouillet de ce livre sont les tourments qu'il souffrit pour nous, pour nos péchés, doucement et amoureusement. Ainsi, comme nous tournons tous les fouilles d'un livre, tournons et retournons toute la vie à notre vrai ami Jésus-Christ. J'en y trouvant ce tourment et douleur et angoisse. Ce livre fut enluminé d'azur et de vermillon. Son beauté corporelle se tolille pour notre amour. Quand il moua sa char fraîche et colorée, en char inde, et décoloré, ce est les azures de notre livre. Mais mout est le livre plus beau qu'on l'enluminement et d'azur et de vermillon ensemble. Le vermillon fut le sang précieux de précieux corps Jésus-Christ, notre Seigneur, en savant. So the reader's recollection of the passion is somatically embodied in the codex that reactivates it, even as the book serves as a stimulus to opening up and perusing that recollection. This is a sophisticated book culture in which French is at once a language of courtly ardor and a vernacular écriture sainte. Ardent Bernardine reading in the Book of Christ's Passion in Elizabeth de Vere's book is, pub is followed by treatises on the courtoise spirituality of the heavenly household, instructions for mass, penitential and memento mori treatises, and some heavy hitters such as translations of Innocent III's De Miseria Humana Conditionis and Hugh of St. Victor's philosophico-contemplative treatise De Ara Animae. We can use this book and its owner's life, I think, to speculate about how this collection might work. Elizabeth de Vere's life seems to have been relatively untroubled in the 1440s when Osborne Bockenham wrote a legend, a, a holy legend of St. Elizabeth of Hungary in the English of Suffolk's badge for her. 
But following unexpected treason accusations, Elizabeth de Vere's husband and eldest son were swiftly executed in 1462 as Lancastrians loyal to Henry VI and all property, excepting Elizabeth's mother's manor of Wivenhoe, was expropriated as the wife of a traitor. Then in 1471, Elizabeth's second son, John de Vere, escaped from the Yorkist King Edward IV's prison in Calais. Elizabeth's person and remaining property were immediately put in the custody of Edward IV's brother, the Duke of Gloucester and future King Richard III. Forcibly ending Elizabeth's visit to Stratford at Bow Convent, Gloucester took the elderly countess to his London house and threatened her until she signed over her remaining property. She died shortly afterwards. These life experiences and Elizabeth de Vere's French book can illuminate each other. Texts such as her book's French prose translation of Innocent III on the misery of human life with its lavish accounts of the futility of lordship and the misery of serfs are teamed with texts on God's heavenly household. Together, they construct exile and alienation as the human condition in order to offer again a home at a permanently stable court. In the heavenly court, allegiance is always to the same king and to an uncontested throne. This spirituality might well speak with special eloquence to the privileged and yet catastrophe-ridden lives led by many noble women and their families in the Wars of the Roses. Now, the final three books I've discussed are all part of a southeastern, largely East Anglian literary culture. And indeed, all four books I've cited here are ambitious and purposive collections. For our literary history, there seems no good reason why their owners should not join such figures as Alice Chaucer, Duchess of Suffolk, Anne Stafford, Catherine Stapleton, or other book owners and patrons whom we know well because even when Francophone, they owned some English language texts. Um, I haven't actually had room to put the English language patronesses on this very crowded slide, which is an extremely crude attempt to show you many of the women I've been talking about, their foundations, their magnate um, residences, and the arrows are some of the Francophone transactions and contacts that go on in this um, largely East Anglian society. Uh, I, but I think we ought to have these Francophone ladies and um, the, the ladies who own Anglophone texts all in together on our conceptual maps. Finally, a brief epilogue. Elizabeth de Vere's book arrived at its post-dissolution home in Cofton Court, Warwickshire, brought there by Elizabeth Throckmorton, uh, the last abbess of Denny, Marie de saint Paul's foundation, and brought to her family home. The book arrived with pristine and uncommented inner pages, though its outer folios were scribbled on at Cofton Court by various Johns and Williams, perhaps some of the foolish youths anticipated with dread by Richard of Berry in his Philo Biblon of 1245. Here as elsewhere, we have, or currently believe we have, in many ways, less evidence for women than for men. But the barking nuns probably wanted to write in their books because they had to be forbidden to do so. Abbess Sybil de Felton's 1404 revision of Barking's Ordinal adds extra provisions in French to the Latin account of the Abbey's annual book distribution procedures, which is more or less the standard Benedictine account. She adds that the nuns must not write in their books with any writing instrument whatsoever, or leave them lying in the choir, in the choir or cut out choirs or leaves, and they must return them to the librarian in the same condition or better, if possible, in même état ou mieux, si être peu, as they were received. We don't get marginalia from the nuns, but we get vigorous management of book culture from their abbess. Women may leave fewer marks, but they are always there and always doing something. We shouldn't allow nationalist philology and the teleological drive of literary histories written under its ages to restrict women's multilingual and transnational reach and agency to English. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. That was truly wonderful. Such a 
such a, a rich uh, um, a sort of exposition that goes, went across languages, manuscripts, genres, rhetorics, households and institutional contexts. Um, we've already got questions coming in the question and answer. And I think rather than the chat, that's the place to um, to put your questions and um, and comments, and we will try to manage those and bring those to Jocelyn. Jocelyn, do you want to unscreen save uh, share? Oh, thank sorry. you. Yes. Um, Although I have yeah. to say that the, the image is really really striking. Um, it's quite something. Um, well, I would have done it in Prezi, but Prezi makes me throw up, so it has to be rather you know. I'm sorry. Um, and in the pandemic, I've lacked any bright grads who could help me. <laughs> well, I have to say it, 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 it oh, oh, we do have chat. No, no, we don't. Okay. Um, right. in the, in, so, so if people um, put their questions in the question and answer and we will relay them to Jocelyn and, um, and, and then if we can, we will try and uh, facilitate conversation by unmuting people if they would like to uh, ask their question directly. Um, but I will I will post the ones because they're already coming in. Um, and so there's one here from Jerry McIntosh, who asks, how important was it for English noblewomen to know law French? Well, they are landowners and managers. Um, they often have to fight for their dower against their sons. Um, they need they fight to gain property or to retain it they need to know what the law says um and either they know it themselves which they and they can understand many of the documents they need through french um and some of them of course have some latin um and uh they do have staffs whose duty it is to um, do this, and even women of lower socioeconomic status, as I said, can hire scriveners and so on, to use the instruments of the law. Um, I didn't really have time to go into Magna Carta, but one of the fascinating things about it is that it is, of course, constantly recopied, and in French, um, far more often than we think. Um, you know, the statutes keep on being revised um, all through the Middle Ages, and there are many French collections of them, now largely in the possession of little scribbly manuscript books belonging to law clerks. Um, but sometimes I think it may have been possible for women to see clause six, which comes near the beginning and sta starts off, nul veuve, cette décrète, no widow shall be constrained to remarry um, as long as she pays a fine to us, the king, if she holds from us. Um, I didn't put it in the um, talk because it's it's not yet decided, it's controversial among art historians, but Michael A. Michaels a long time ago suggested that Philippa of Haino commissioned um, a book for her wedding to Edward III, and, it, and she commissioned it from a scribe who knew Anglo-Norman usage. Um, Serge Lusignon has shown us the scribes are often very smart about giving documents from Haino a Haino flavour and documents from England the flavour of England if it was necessary for diplomatic or political reasons. Um, and um, uh, there, there was a copy of the statutes in French in that and round about folio two before she went on to read Brunetto La, uh, Latini's Tresor and other interesting works, Philippa might well have seen the statutes of English law, nous le veuve, c'est des um, So I think in all sorts of ways, the law was of interest to women and I think they had multiple forms of access. And of course, if you remember that um, abbesses had a baronial status and had rights of gallows and all sorts of other things, women also sometimes had to apply the law. Can't hear you, Athena. There we go. Um, I'm going to allow people to talk uh, if I if I can. Yeah. If I, uh, so, um, when I ask their question, um, there is no requirement to talk, but um, I'm going to create the permission in case you want to say something. If you want, if, in case you want to respond. So, Jerry, I've 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 opened you up if you would like to respond to to Jocelyn. Um. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I just was thinking that La French might be a way for women to understand the importance of learning French. Oh, I think so. Um, I think that's right, particularly if they grew up to run landed estates and large households, and particularly also if they grew up as um, 
merchant uh, in merchant households and even perhaps some artisanal households. And I think that's right. Um, though I think one would have to say they've also been predisposed to learn French because so much of the early Salter and Primer reading culture is partly francophone. But yeah, yeah. I just have really enjoyed your talk. And as an early modernist, I found it very illuminating. Oh, thank you. I wondered if you worked on Law French yourself and um, had things you could tell me. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> but very nice to have an early modernist. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, we'll um, uh, go to Hirsch J, um, who's asked, um, is it possible to discern a separate and gendered late medieval devotional tradition in East Anglia? And if so, what do you consider its hallmarks may have been? Well, I don't, the trouble is, I don't really want to separate the languages because they're not separate in the lives of the people who are using the texts, either in English or in French. What I really want um, is more people to work across both because I'm afraid it, it just takes ages to read these manuscripts, often with unedited texts. The 28 treatises in Elizabeth de Burgh's book are awfully long. Um, and you know the only way to get at them really, and this um, their significance in this book is to read them in manuscript. And the same holds for all these other huge compilations. Um, and what um, is on my own agenda to do is to take the devotional compilation left by Elizabeth de Burgh's daughter-in-law, married to her second son John, um, which was in English, quite well known among Middle English people, Harley one seven zero six, and to read across that and all of the other treatises owned by Barking, um, uh, devotional compilations owned by Barking, um, to see how that might have functioned if you're a woman with access to both. So um, I don't want to say that French is a women's language. It's not, manifestly, it's used by men. Um, and um, uh, though I want to say it's important for women, um, I should add that in my view, one of the most under-researched texts in, in late medieval literature is the fabulous Livre de Sainte Médecine by Henry of Lancaster, Duke, uh, Henry of Gaumont, Duke of Lancaster, written in 1354. This is a book, a spiritual treatise composed by a layman. It deserves the kind of attention we've been giving to Marjorie Kemp and Julian of Norwich, but it hasn't had it because it's in French. But there's no excuse now because it's got an absolutely brilliant translation by Catherine Batt with annotation, multilingual annotation, the like of which I haven't seen since um, Emily, um, oh, you know, wonderful Emily annotated the book of Marjorie Kemp. Um, and um, so I don't want to say it's separate, it's overlapping, it's often shared, but I do want to say it's important for women. And one of the reasons that that table I gave you, a very crude table, and you know, it's hellishly impossible to count manuscripts, let alone even date them very closely. But the, um, the crude table shows a huge number of um, French items in the 14th, late 14th and 15th century. And this is partly because Dean and Bolton faithfully catalogued every time a prayer was added in a book and had it as an item there. And I think that's important because that's an individual act by a lay person, some of, often, some of them men, but many of them women, some of them named or some of them with feminine pronouns in the prayer um, that they added or had added to their books. So do you see what I mean? It seems to me impossible to have a separate tradition, but um, of course you, you need to take gender into account as an important um, hermeneutic category, but the people we're thinking about didn't separate languages, they lived in a multilingual culture as, if we think about it, do we? Super, uh, thank you. Um, the next question is from a PhD student, um, Olivia Colquitt, um, and uh, she asks, uh, she says, thank you for such a wonderful lecture. I was wondering whether there were any notable patterns in the books that women leave to female relatives in their wills. Do we find a lot of French books being inherited by women? Yes, quite a number. Um, and um, since Eleanor of Gloucester's on my mind, I can tell you she was really careful about what she did. She left her second best Psalter, which is kind of the equivalent of leaving the second Rolls Royce, I suppose, to her secular daughter, Anne. 
and she, to her daughter Isabella, who was a nun at the London Minories and became abbess, she left a collection of books in French, including a translation of Gratian's Decretals, um, which sadly doesn't survive. What we do have is a much later 15th century English collection of statutes for Godstow Abbey. Um, but um, there are many books left uh, in French by women and often um, carefully directed to appropriate um, daughters and sons. Um, the, the, there's been a, a generation of work on this, starting with, I think, really Carol Meal's wonderful initiative in, what was it, 1993 on women and literature in Britain. And you'll find many essays there and later that detail these books, as well as, of course, in that, um, uh, that first repertoire of book owners by Susan Kavanagh, which was a doctoral thesis that everybody still has to look up. Olivia, did you want to say anything? Um, no, I um, just wanted to thank you for your uh, insights on that. Um, I was thinking of Carol Neal's book, actually, um, oh, as you're talking about a lot of this multilingualism. Um, so it's just nice to hear your further thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, we the next question um, are from Edward uh, Mills. Um, says, thank you, Jocelyn, for a fascinating presentation. Just a quick question, if there's time. Um, based on the fascinating phrase on memestat umye that you touched on at the end of the paper. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what a better state might look like if the nuns book culture is being managed, as you put it, how might the nuns themselves have been invited to participate in that process? Well, I wondered if they perhaps sometimes sewed some of those plucked out leaves back in. Um, though I'd like more evidence for that. It's until I found Sybil uh, de Felton's ordinance. It was one of the sorrows of my life that the wonderful Campsy manuscript shows no candle grease, even though it has an inscription saying that it was read at mealtimes. But um, I, I think that um, we do, of course, get women writing in books, writing inscriptions of ownership and writing those things. But there does seem to have been a bit of a nunnery culture of keeping your books clean. Um, so the way the women participated, and it's significant here that um, uh, Sybil de Felton's, uh, the additional ordinances are in French, may well have been um, by using French among the English and, Latin, and in some cases Latin books um, that they could have for a year's reading. Each nun was given a book for the year. Um, and so I think, you know, they had plenty of opportunity of participating and plenty as St. Edmund of Abingdon envisages in his highly influential and trilingual um, speckle in the Clésier, plenty of opportunity of talking about books in chapter, in cloister, in recreation, something also that the uh, author of Ancrona Wissa um, discusses and something which Elizabeth Tyler in her brilliant book on Anglo-Latin patronage, which also reaches out to show how this shaped the very first French texts composed in England, which is essentially the beginning of Francophone literary culture, um, because we only have very scattered texts from the continent, um, that, that, that um, talk about texts is one of the most important things. And she's able to trace this very closely in the courts of Knut and Edward the Confessor, and then moving on to Henry I and Adelita and Matilda. So, you know, I, I think the women had their opportunities, but I think they tried to keep their books and their noses clean when possible. Edward, did you want to um, come back at all? Hello? We can't hear you yet. Oh, hello. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm actually currently on a train, so I can't really uh, respond okay. to that. But thank you very much, Jocelyn, for that fascinating paper. Thank you. Uh, super. Look up um, in the biblio. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I will take one more from the Q&A, and then there's a couple of hands up in the chat. Uh, so um, Ad Putter asks, um, Jocelyn mentioned many additions to Dean and Bolton being made. Are these in public domain yet? Uh, this is the PhD. Um, we all want to know about these. <laughs> yes. Of the audience. Well, this, this would be, if I had footnotes, this would be purse com. It's what Julia Matteson kindly asked me when I asked that question, which of course, Ed, I wanted to know just as much as you do. Um, and um, she's doing, uh, she's done um, uh, a doctorate at Toronto, Ce Livre et à moi, French Books in Medieval England. Um, and um, 
she's doing uh, a postdoc as well. So I expect that work will be soon added to her existing publications. Um, and she was certainly very gracious when I wrote to her and asked and, and uh, told me both how she'd gone about it and what the findings so far are. And they, they are pretty exciting. Uh, super. Um, uh, so we're going to talk, turn to uh, a couple of hands in the chat. So um, the, the first is um, Marina Vidas, uh, if you'd like to ask your question to Jocelyn. I think you have to unmute yourself. Okay, we'll, we'll go to somebody else. Um, Andrew P has um, has also um, uh, uh, so, uh, put up his hand in the chat. Um, so Andrew, do you have a question for Jocelyn? Hmm. Hmm. Is the global unmuting not working perhaps, Dina? Uh, it, 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 it should be. Um, It should be okay. Um, uh, hmm, okay, well, I'll go. We'll go on to um, to the next one in the Q and A. And um, and Andrew Marina, um, uh, if you uh, want to pop your question in the Q and A, um, I'm using the same uh, technique as others. I'm not sure why um, that's not coming through. Um, uh, okay, so the next question is uh, Mary Bateman, um, who's asked. I am interested in the image from the Psalter showing Christ's blood reviving Adam and his sons at the foot of the cross. I'm not a specialist in devotional literature, but I've come across something similar recently in text form, and I'm interested to see it again here. I was wondering if Professor Wogan Brown knows if this is a common figuring of the harrowing of hell. Uh, no, I, I don't believe it is very common. Um, I've discussed this with um, one or two helpful art historians, and I think it's relatively rare. Um, but um, you also, I think, find the Amesbury Psalter in um, the very good book by Nina Rowe on church and synagogue. Um, and I haven't got access to that during the pandemic, um, alas, but um, you may find some further information there. Um, where, uh, was your text one of the um, legends of the Holy Rood text type? Uh, it was not. It was actually mentioned in passing in a text, uh, Middle English text, the, uh, the version of the Assumption of the Virgin and um, the death and burial of Mary. Um, oh, how interesting, yeah. I, in a manuscript I was looking up for something quite other, actually. I was looking at the romance um, parts of it and it struck me as interesting and I just wanted, to, I was very interested in the picture and just wanted to ask about it so thank you very much it's very exciting um, yes i'm sorry i don't have more but no doubt you will find something more i hope so thanks for such a wonderful paper it's been wonderful thank you um so uh, the next question is from joe costa who says jocelyn i don't know if it's a barking manuscript but the library of congress manuscript 4 folio 37 recto which is an english translation of the benedictine rule for nuns has an English translation of Sibylla of Barking's rules against writing in manuscripts or cutting things out of them. And she's attached an image. Uh, uh, she's, she's, uh, she's put the link for, for, for an image. I'll put Joe up. Sorry. Joe, there you go. And you should be able to, you should be able to talk to Jocelyn. Hello, Jocelyn, Hi. lovely to see you. Hello. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Um, actually, Jean Kachalis put me onto this manuscript a long time ago. Ah. And it is very early 15th century. I mean, just right around turn of the century. And it's got um, the Gospel of Nicodemus in it. And it's also got, um, uh, there's one other a text, uh, a Middle English exposition on the Creed, I think, if I remember properly. Right. Um, but it's again that same kind of, but it's all Middle English. It's no French in it. Right. And that's Library of Congress four. Library of Congress four, yes. Yeah. That fits perfectly, I think, with the with the state of Barking's literary culture in the 15th century. Um, it has these two massive French books, 
um, as it had some earlier ones, but it, um, and earlier Latin ones, but it also has a lot of English. I mean, people are now starting to work, you know, we're in, by the late 15th century, people are working in English, mm -hmm. um, but some people are still in French and in English together. Um, so um, it's, it's very interesting and it sounds like a sensible thing for the nunnery to have done, but I, um, I'm so grateful to you for the reference, Joe, and I will follow that with uh, great interest. Well, glad to pass it along. There's also a rebus of the scribe, which is either a stork or a heron or possibly a crane. Um, Jean thought that the scribe might have been a woman named Crane because there's also a picture of a woman in a wimple right next Array. to the rebus of the stork. Right, time to get out the um, barking prosopography, such as yes, it is. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a I'm wonderful sick. paper. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for that very generous contribution. I'm very excited. Come on, pandemic, stop it so I can get at more of these things. Um, there's an, another question now from Andrew and Margaret Scott, um, uh, who asks, um, the description of blue ink being a reflection of Christ's blue, bruised flesh in the De Vere text, was this original or just a trope? Oh, that's from Margaret. Um, I haven't, um, well, I haven't seen exactly this full a version and so somatic a version of the book trope, but there's a mass of stuff around, um, Marlene Cray and other people know a lot about this, of using the fluids of the crucifixion in parallel with the, um, uh, with with the colours used in a book. Um, I haven't personally seen this elsewhere, but, um, you know, I've got more research to do on all these things. If you know somewhere else where it turns up, I'd be very delighted to know. I mean, specifically the, the livid flesh. <laughs> but, you know, I bet you it's somewhere. Uh, thank you, Jocelyn. Um, I, I don't, I think it's a rather disgusting image <laughs> from a modern well, point of view, but an interest. Is that, yes. Yes, um, I'm sorry, I had to miss the first 10 minutes and I couldn't get in till 10 past five. My fault, I was engaged, but it was, I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, so there's a comment from, um, from Delbert Russell. Uh, fascinating Delbert. as always. Congratulations, Jocelyn. On the bettering of manuscripts, perhaps the nuns erased errors. What a nice thought, Delbert. Um, I don't see any traces of it in the De Vere book, but then it's a highly orthodox and highly polished set of treatises, so maybe they didn't find errors, but this is another category we might want to look at in barking books. Um, what about yourself? I mean, you've done all that um, terrific work on the St. Paul Edgerton manuscript. Have you found women doing that sort of thing? No, I haven't really. No, I just thought they're cleaning the book up. Maybe they get rid of errors. Yes. I could use error correction myself, I'm sure. What, what's that, Delbert? I could use a lot of error correction myself. So well, couldn't we all? But yeah, um, I mean, it is, it is certainly the way in which 19th century scholars, um, you know, William Skeet and others, Sanford Meach a bit later with Marjorie Kemp, um, you know, they do employ women to clean things up a bit, don't they? Right. <laughs> but um, I, I'm not so sure in Barking and then also perhaps um, not so many of the books needed cleaning up. But I will bear that in mind as I work through the English books too, because I suspect with English orthography being the rough and rugged thing it is, um, people might be more prone to think something was a bit off there. Right. Well, very fascinating lecture. Thank you again. Oh, thank you, Delbert. Um, a question from Richard Ingham, who says, have you come across any clues as to how women learned their French? Only, um, well, you know, the go-to place is Denise de Montchaine, isn't it? Um, but that, of course, is now agreed to be slightly advanced form of French. Um, but, um, Oh gosh, now who, who is the person who's working on this? Oh goodness me. Um, I'm sorry, it's a young scholar. Oh, sorry, it's Rory Critton um, has some thoughts about um, uh, women learning to read in French, but I don't think they're yet fully expressed or published. Um, so I, I don't, I can't really go any further. Um, Richard, can you do something? Because you're so much of your work shows 
extraordinarily, and one needs a real linguist to do this, you get out of written documents credible evidence for speech, and that's really difficult to do. I mean, do you have any thoughts yourself? Um, no, I think this is a slightly different point about speech. Uh -huh. um, I, I, I just wonder whether, okay, I did a lot of work uh, some, some, some years ago on how the standard of French in works written by men, copied by men, it, it declined very, very clearly in the late 14th century yeah. after the abandonment of French as a vehicle language in grammar schools. Yeah. There seemed to be a clear uh, correlation there. And since women didn't go to grammar schools, but presumably aristocratic women learned their French in some other way, um, possibly that would mean you wouldn't expect to see that sharp decline in French at that time. Yes, that's interesting. Yeah, I think that, you know, their mothers is probably the, you know, the most likely answer. Okay, okay. But, yeah. No, but, that's fine, thanks. But given the, how important the reading culture is, you know, um, if women uh, enjoyed reading and often reading collectively and, you know, an oral yeah. matrix, romance and religion and, you know, all the other things available to them in French, um, they may well have, you know, acquired more and more French as they went on as well. It does sound as if the uh, use of French continued quite a long time as, as well. Yeah, so yeah. That's interesting. Well, thanks. Well, that was a but, fascinating but lecture. Thank you. Written French. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Question from uh, Cecilia Hatt. Uh, the book trope is partly from Bonaventura and Lu uh, Ludolf the Carthusian, uh -huh. uh, also Colossians chapter four. Bishop John Fisher makes extensive use of it in his sermon given on a Good Friday. Oh, right, right. Um, this, um, this text is actually, I mean, it's pseudo-Bernardine, um, but William Marx found that it's, um, Oh, it's Ogier of, um, oh dear me, an Italian place. I just can't remember at the moment. Um, so it does have a Latin source um, uh, in the form in which we find it in the, in the uh, book, which I should have mentioned earlier. But that's very helpful, thank you, because that does suggest um, more widely the prevalence of the trope. Um, but um, the fact that the uh, De Vere book um, gets it through... Um, a Bernardine, a, a pseudo Bernardine reworking of Ogier of um, somewhere beginning with L in Italy. Um, William Marx is the person who, who um, skewered that one. Um, uh, the fact that they get it from there suggests it comes in multiple streams. And so it is moderately prevalent. Um, the fact also, I think that, um, you know, you can do it with just a bifolium in um, the earlier book, the earlier Saint Paul book. Um, is also suggestive that, you know, it, it's occurred to a lot of people. And one of the things it says to me is just how intensely literate and book practiced this uh, reading culture was. Uh, hello? Hello? Oh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. No, I, ju I just wanted to, to, to add because um, I, I've edited this sermon of John Fisher's and so I did oh, right. a bit of research about, about the uh, the source of his his uh, his um, um, There's also uh, it's connected also to the medieval charters of Christ. Yes. And a com comment by Augustine about the Colossians passage, and so we we have a mixture of different pictures of of uh, a, a skin like a drum, but also a, a person's skin. So Jesus's skin and. Um, uh, so then we have the charters of Christ, we have a parchment on which things are written. And so there's, there's a kind of fusing of the two images of, of a written message and Christ's skin, which is itself a message, if you see what I mean. It's, it's yeah. quite a complicated one, but it's got a very, very rich uh, ancestry. But I was just thinking that that is fantastically rich. I've been looking for charters of Christ in French, and they seem to be only in English and perhaps uh, Anglo-Latin a bit. But do, uh, do you know of any French ones? Because I don't. I don't really. I just found the, the reference. Oh, crumbs. I can't remember the name of the editor now. But um, I mean, I, I don't like to say this, but if you if you want to look at my edition of John Fisher's sermons, of I do. <laughs> it, it will be in the uh, in the notes to that. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much. That's going to enrich the way I can think about Elizabeth de Vere's book. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and uh, 
Um, and finally, um, we have a comment and a question from Michael Sargent. Uh, the comment is from their mothers was Pam Scheingorn's answer to the question, not linguistically specific, how women learn to read. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the question is, are you saying Meech employed Alan? Uh, no, she was an independent scholar. Um, but I'm just saying that he gets his name on the book. Ruth Meech transcribes him. Emily, I hope Emily Allen writes this, writes this wonderful set of notes, um, which is kind of a map of Anglo-French uh, Anglo literary culture. Um, and Sanford Meech gets the, gets the name on the book. That's all. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just wondering the the direction you were you were looking at the relationship working. Um, she, after all, discovered it and well, yes. went and went to EETS to propose an addition, and they required her to take a male uh, text editor to work with her. So they got her to get Meech to do the thing, and she moved to Michigan. Um, yeah. And somehow their relationship blew up and she left soon after. Yeah, I remember. Um, and uh, um, the only notes in the, um, uh, in the edition that were written by her actually have her initials on them. Yeah. Um, and then the rest of her papers went to Bryn Mawr. Yeah, but she gets the, the, the French parallels in, in a way that you don't see many people doing. Um, but you're absolutely right. Michael and I, you know, I wonder, had she been um, a landed aristocrat in England, I wonder if anybody, if even Eats would have dared um, to suggest she got, got a man in to um, make the enterprise authoritative. But you, um, you interestingly point out the way in which um, our assumption that the Middle Ages are misogynistic and confining for women is a very self-flattering one. Indeed. Thank you. Okay, well, it's, uh, uh, you, you, we've taken a lot of your time and we're so grateful to you, Jocelyn, um, for the most incredibly um, rich paper and discussion that's moved us around in the most uh, in incredible way, um, and geographically, uh, in terms of in kind of the, 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 the places um, and context in which women were working and thinking and, and speaking, um, and the, the the manuscript cultures, the, the religious and political cultures, the legal cultures, um, and the registers and the rhetorics uh, that they deployed. Uh, it's been a really, um, it's been an absolute feast. Um, I'm sorry that on a webinar we can't, um, there's no setting that allows people to erupt in, in applause and, uh, and, and voluble appreciation, but I know, um, I know everybody is doing it uh, in their, you know, in their boxes. Um, I certainly am here. Um, so um, on behalf of the Society and the Centre for Medieval Studies at York, to say thank you for a really wonderful paper. Um, we're going to be thinking about this for, for a very long time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Athena, and many thanks to the audience. It's always the, a privilege to give a paper because you learn so much from other people by doing so. So thank you and thank you to all the audience. And thank you to everybody for coming. Um, it's been great to have you. Now, how do we get...